Dr. Prachari, let's start with some light and give us some good news about where progress is being made in the war on climate change. What's going well? Well, I think progress is being made right here in California. I mean, this is a state which is doing remarkable things. And as I always uh, have put forward the view, uh, this is not only a model for the U.S., it could be a model for the world. And it shows how people and the leadership of any society working together on the basis of knowledge and information that tells you what would happen if you don't take action and how attractive it is to take action uh, is really what makes this state unique. And there are lots of other cities, towns, companies, businesses, individuals that are doing a lot. Of course, we need to scale up all these efforts because we don't have the luxury of time. We really have to move rapidly and we have to move adequately to deal with the challenge of climate change. Because if we don't do that, then I think the costs and the feasibility of getting to a pathway that gives you less than two degrees Celsius increase in temperature by the end of this century may go beyond our reach. Uh, Dr. Bachari, we, we talked about divestment. Recently, 300 Stanford professors wrote a letter asking that Stanford divest. It's happening among churches and universities. You used to serve on the board of an oil company in India. How do you view divesting from fossil fuels? Is that meaningful or is that just a symbol? Well, that was almost a lifetime ago, it seems. I was on the board of Indian Oil Corporation. And the very first meeting that I attended as a member of the board, I said, you guys have to convert yourselves from, a, from an oil company to an energy company. And there was a lot of discussion as to how do we do that. I said, let's hold a retreat where people come with well-prepared presentations on the kinds of options that could be created and pursued. And we spent an entire day and some actions were put in place to get into renewable energy, to bring about improvements in energy efficiency and so on. Well, soon after that, I left the board, and I'm afraid things are back to where they were. <laughs> but that's often what happens, you know. It takes an individual, it takes um, uh, just somebody's motivation to get things going. Uh, and I think what you see in Apple, of course, they are very fortunate to have someone like Lisa Jackson at uh, the helm of affairs in this particular field. But clearly, this is a case of enlightened leadership. This is what I was referring to. And if we had more of this, I think, um, as Lisa rightly said, this would also enable government policy being put in place. Because uh, often what happens is that um, uh, governments are worried about what business might do. And often, they have reasons to worry because businesses can be very resistant. I don't mind mentioning this in public. I had a meeting with um, Chancellor Angela Merkel in, uh, in Germany just before the Copenhagen Conference of the Parties. And she asked me the question, how do we get the Americans on board? I, I, I said that um, one way to do it would be for President Obama to have a dialogue with uh, business leaders in that country. She says, yes, I think you're right. I said, Madam Chancellor, why don't you get your business leaders to talk some, to some of the counterparts over there? She shook her head and she says, no, I'm afraid if the American giant wakes up, we'll have competition. Yeah. Ah. It's also a question of times. It's also a question of the awareness, uh, the perceived urgency of taking action. Dr. Bachara, I clearly remember being in Delhi at your conference, and there's diplomats and uh, experts from around the world, and someone stood up from the Maldives, and the room got very silent. For them, this is an ex existential issue. These are people who contributed very little, who their way of life and their country is going away. So talk to us about the moral dimension of this, the Asian Pacific countries uh, that are threatened by what we've done. Well, I think in the fifth assessment report, and particularly in the synthesis report, we, which we released on the 2nd of November last year, 
we have clearly highlighted the ethical, the equity, and the larger dimensions that really should motivate us to take action. And one of them certainly relates to those parts of the world which are really vulnerable and are in fact suffering already. One of the points that I'd like to put forward is the clear finding that we brought out in a special report in 2011 and which we've also included in the fifth assessment report. The fact that extreme events are on the increase and two types of extreme events in particular, heat waves and extreme precipitation events. Now, I certainly can't scientifically link any single event to human-induced climate change, but the aggregation, the trend, and the entire picture that's now before us and observations going back over time clearly show that the intensity and frequency of these extreme events is on the increase. And if we don't do anything about this problem, then clearly these are going to become far more difficult to manage. So much so that in some parts of the world, we would see that those heat waves which currently take place once in 20 years, by the end of the century, could occur once in two years. So, <clears throat> looking at some of the most vulnerable regions in the world, and the fact that they are inhabited by some of the poorest sections of human society, there is obviously a moral dimension to the problem, which we've highlighted in the fifth assessment report of the IPCC. In fact, I might mention the synthesis report in its 50-odd authors, because, you know, this is not something which relates only to hard science, where you only look at the physical basis. There's human society which has to be taken into account. And that's what we've tried to do. And I think this is where the world has to understand that we've got to take action and take that action early. Because otherwise the impacts of climate change are going to become so difficult we could be crossing thresholds and tipping points beyond which we would not be able to retrace our steps. Since we're talking about sea level rise, let me mention that since the beginning of the last century through 2010, the average sea level rise in the world has been 19 centimeters. That's close to a foot. If we don't do anything about this problem and we don't have additional mitigation, then by the end of this century, we could get sea level rise as high as 98 centimeters. That's almost a meter. So you can imagine there are parts of the world which are barely a meter above sea level. And well before that, storm surges, coastal flooding, and extreme events are going to make it impossible for people to live in these locations. Let me also mention that, you know, even if we are able to limit temperature increase to 2 degrees Celsius by the end of the century, that will still be accompanied by sea level rise between 26 centimeters to 55 centimeters. That means even if you're in the middle of that range somewhere, that's pretty high, let's say 40 centimeters. That's a threat to places in the U.S. That's a threat to a, perhaps a much more and a much more severe threat to other parts of the world. And for people who maybe don't remember their high school metric to uh, English conversion, can you put that in American for us? Well, <laughs> well I have a feeling, and I don't make, want to make a prediction, that perhaps by the end of the century, America may convert to the metric system. <laughs> it's taken about 50 years, and maybe another 100 years would do it. Let's talk about some of the technologies that you think that are most promising. Where, where can technology, solar is probably one of the brightest stories out there. There's a lot of solar happening in India. Uh, it's, it's advertised all over the place. Let's talk about the bright spots in the technology. Dr. Pachari. Well, I think what we brought out in the fifth assessment report is the fact that there has to be a very rapid and a very early reduction in emissions. Just to give you some indication, if we want to limit temperature increase to 2 degrees Celsius by the end of the century, then by 2050 you need a 40 to 70 percent reduction in emissions over the 2010 baseline. 
Now that's pretty drastic. What does that mean? It means that you need a trebling or a quadrupling of zero or low carbon energy supply. So that means a sharp change in the energy supply mix that the world is currently accustomed to. We've also said that by the end of the century, you have to have zero or negative emissions. Now this means that you'll need substantial improvements in energy efficiency, a large utilization of renewable sources of energy, possibly nuclear, if there are societies that want to adopt nuclear, carbon capture and storage, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, and among all the technologies and all the policy options that are going to bring this about, another important issue is going to be changes in lifestyles and behavior. Now, this doesn't mean that we have to go back and live in caves and wrap ourselves in sheepskin. But what this does mean is getting rid of waste. Um, perhaps changes in diet, certainly stopping the waste of food that takes place all over the world. You changed your diet. How have you changed your diet on this? Well, that's a personal decision. Fifteen years ago, I decided to become a vegetarian. And I can tell you, I, um, I've never felt healthier than I do now. But, you know, that's a personal decision. Um, I mean, we talked about the fact that I flew in last night and I'll be going back again tomorrow. But um, I don't seem to feel any loss of energy because I changed my diet. Mm -hmm. Dr. Pachari, India, more than a billion people, a lot of aspiring consumers who want to live like Americans, have the lifestyle that we enjoy. Um, How does that play out in a climate context? Well, let me first mention that in the case of choosing and adopting a low carbon sort of pathway of development, there are huge co-benefits. I mean, the first co-benefit that I'd like to highlight is energy security. Uh, the second would be improved air quality at the local level and in general a much better environment at the local level. There's also growing evidence that you get much higher employment from some of these options. And uh, I think therefore what you really need is a combination of innovation, which of course is induced by policy but also as we discussed earlier by visionary leadership in the corporate sector. But personal choices make a difference. You take the city of Copenhagen, you see so many people using bicycles over there and they have absolutely dreadful weather <laughs> most parts of the year. So if those guys want to use bicycles rather than jump into their cars, they've got something going in their favor, no doubt about it. But you know, as far as India is concerned, um, yes, there is this growing uh, set of aspirations in fact, Tom Friedman, who's a good friend, always says um, even the poorest in India have middle class aspirations. And often you go to a slum, the only thing you find over there is a television set. And the downside of that is what are those guys watching on those TV sets? Soap ops, <laughs> which fuel these dreams of consuming more and more, getting a car, a bigger house, air conditioning. So, I mean, you can't deny people choices that are obviously coming into their living spaces and are at their doorstep. But this is where I think Gandhi, in a sense, was right. He was once asked, wouldn't you want India to become as prosperous as Britain? And he responded, look, it took Britain to use half the resources of this planet to reach its level of prosperity. How many planets would a country like India require? So I think if everybody in India wants to live the American dream, then I think there's going to be a problem. And I think we'll see that problem very soon. So I think the government and the people are realizing that. We had a solar energy mission which was formulated in 2010 for setting up 20,000 megawatts of solar capacity roughly in the next eight years or so. Uh, the new government is planning to up that to 100,000 megawatts. Now that's a stiff target, but it signals the signs of change. 
and a desire on the part of Indian society to deal with climate change effectively. And I think some of us can take a little bit of credit for that because we have created awareness and I think people are understanding that it's also a major deviation from values that Indian society has been built on for thousands of years. So I'm optimistic and I think if some major entities across the globe were to set an example and show that you can develop, you can lead a better existence without necessarily emitting greenhouse gases at the same intensity, that will be a very powerful model for others to follow. And that's where, again, I come back to California. The state is quite remarkable in that respect, and companies like Apple. I'd like to ask you both a personal question before we go to the audience questions. Uh, you both have experienced quite virulent personal attacks uh, and uh, in, from political adversaries, etc. I'm curious how that experience has been for you, and also you're dealing with something that's really, Dr. Pachar, you say you're optimistic, but this is pretty heavy stuff, and how you keep that optimism? Is it you know, chocolate, yoga, alcohol? What, what, what helps you? <laughs> well, you'll be asking me to make some very peculiar confessions over here, so... <laughs> Tell us that your secrets, okay. But, but, you know, I think in the ultimate analysis, you've got to be sure of yourself. And I think you have to stand up for what you believe in. And you have to stand up on the side of logic. Yes, I was subjected to attacks with a particular newspaper saying that I was making millions of dollars and that I wear thousand dollar suits. Um, but all of this was debunked. I got a a firm of lawyers in London to sue that particular newspaper. And the only way I could commission them is because they agreed to do it on a no-win, no-fee basis. Well, what happened? That particular newspaper settled out of court. Uh, they paid this firm 53,000 pounds for their legal fees, uh, published a measly little apology, <coughs> retracted the article, and the other thing that happened in New Delhi was one of the national channels interviewed my tailor who said, who said you know, I, I charge 2,500 rupees, that's about the equivalent of $40 for, for stitching a full suit. Dr. Pachori is such a miser that he's brought me down to $2,200. <laughs> So, you know, all this aura of my wearing a thousand dollar suits was completely demolished. And I felt, my God, here I am. I thought people regard me as being well dressed. And this guy tells the whole world that I'm wearing very cheap clothes. <laughs> for being here, I'm Holly Kaufman. This is a question for Dr. Pachari. I wanted to ask you about the two degrees, which for this audience is 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, which. It sounds a lot higher for us, so that might be good to use for Americans. It's a big raise in global average temperature. If it's so difficult for us to get to where we need to, uh, to get to two degrees, if we have to make such drastic changes, and we know that after these two degrees or 3.6 degrees, that we will have a lot of calamitous changes on the planet, is two degrees really enough for us to strive for? Is two degrees well, sufficient? I think or three and a half degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, that's something that science really can't determine. I think that's something that society has to decide. But science tells you directly that even with a one degree increase in temperature, there are certain species that are going to be threatened. Science also tells you with a one degree increase in temperature, you'll still have sea level rise, and sea level rise will continue into the next century and that there are extreme events that are going to continue and be become much worse. So I think what the IPCC is doing is placing all the information that it can come up with, that it can assess before human society. And I think with the level of awareness and understanding that hopefully will be created and is being created, we would be able to arrive at a resolution of whether it should be 2 degrees or 1.5 degrees or whatever. But that's a yeah, social value judgment. Let's go to our yeah. next question. Welcome. Uh, despite 
decades of climate negotiations, I hear that climate emissions are still increasing. So I would like to ask, perhaps in Paris, let's say we have a really successful outcome. When, how many years would it take before we reach a peak level of emissions, even with a good outcome? Well, I think if you really want to limit temperature increase to 2 degrees Celsius, then um, the peak in global emissions should really not come after 2025. Earlier preferably, because otherwise the costs of mitigation will go up substantially. And the feasibility of coming up with solutions and technologies would go beyond our reach. So I think the sooner we act, the better it would be. And of course, we'll have to act quite decisively. Because unfortunately, if you look at the increase in emissions between 2000 and 2010, in 2010, the world was emitting 49 gigatons of CO2 equivalent. In the year 2000, it was emitting 39 gigatons. So that means we've been adding one gigaton per year over previous levels in this 10-year period. That goes counter to what the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change requires. So I think we have to move very quickly. And the, the big thing is that you can actually save money in a number of cases by taking the right kinds of actions. Uh, I mentioned co-benefits. I also want to mention that we have found that the cost per year would be 0.06% of global GDP or global consumption if we would pursue a path that takes us to no more than 2 degrees Celsius. So it's not an expensive proposition. It's difficult because we've got accustomed to very, very high rates of growth in emissions. So the turnaround is difficult, but once we decide to do that, the cost is not high at all. We can do this. Um, 